Keith Brogdon is a missionary. He leads the missions efforts of the Assemblies of God throughout the Middle East. And it's a joy for us to have him back this week. Put your hands together. Let's welcome Dick Brogdon. Pastor, if you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 24, we're going to be looking at the first 14 verses of the text, concentrating on verse 14, Matthew chapter 24. I want to thank you for your buddy barrel giving. I am a missionary kid. I was born in Kenya, East Africa. I have benefited from giving like that. When I was seven years old, I went to boarding school where my mom and dad were pioneering. There weren't any good school options in English, and so I was sent away to boarding school. I loved it. It was a great school. It was a British school. I learned Latin and French in the fourth grade, played rugby and cricket and field hockey, studied uh, about British history, but it was not only sports. There was the Boy Scouts. There was music. There was drama all kinds of camping adventures. I loved school. We would go for three months to school, and then we would come home for one month. And as great as school was, it wasn't home. And so at the end of that three-month period, I'd gather my little travel bag, and I'd go sit on the stone steps of school and fix my eyes on the corner of the road around which my father would come to take me home, because all my little seven-year-old heart wanted to do was go home. This world is not our home. We don't belong here. We are strangers. We are pilgrims. We're in school. And there's some fun things about school, but it's not home. And one day, the trumpet will sound, and the Lord will descend, and we will go home. And we will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And we have one solid indicator of that in the scriptures. The Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. We know that the return of the king is imminent. And yet chronologically, this text gives us one insight into when we get to go home. And that's why I'm a missionary. Because I want to go home. And take as many people from the nations as I can with me. Matthew chapter 24 verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you see all these things? Assuredly I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying... Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The disciples asked this critical question. When, King Jesus, when will you come? When will be the end of the age? The recreation of all things, the restoration of all things, when will that happen? Jesus indulges the questions and gives them a series of things that I will make contention all have happened except one. Look at verse 4. First, many will claim to be Messiah and deceive. That's happened. Second, verse 6, you'll hear of wars, rumors of wars. That has happened. Third, verse 7, nation will rise against nation. Happened. Fourth, there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in Turkey and Syria and various places. That's happened. Verse 8. Fifth, suffering, martyrdoms, hated for Jesus' sake, many offended, betraying, hating one another. That's happened. Sixth, false prophets, much deceit, lawliness, perversity abound. Verse 11 and 12. That's happened. Seventh, Endurance through all of these terrors, verse 13, is itself a sign. That's happened. And then finally, after all of those signs of the return of the king, we come to verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom 
will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So verse 14 is my outline. I have six points. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world, all the nations as a witness. And then the end will come. If we're going to summarize the gospel, as Paul did in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, we would say that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. That's beautiful. That's pithy. But Paul wrote this decades after Jesus said this gospel. And Jesus talked of this gospel before he went to the cross, before he died, before he rose. Mark chapter 1, he appeared preaching the gospel. Galatians 3, the gospel was preached to Abraham. Romans 1, all of the prophets promised the gospel. So if that's true, how would you present the gospel to me if you couldn't use any churchy words that hadn't happened yet when Jesus said, this gospel will be preached? You couldn't say cross, you couldn't say blood of Jesus, you couldn't say resurrection, you couldn't say any of those terms that we use to explain the gospel now. What was that gospel that Jesus said would be preached in all the world? The definitive description of God in the Old Testament can be encapsulated from Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. The fact that the Bible says that God is slow to anger infers that God gets angry. It's interesting. And the gospel itself just simply means good news, which indicates there has to be bad news. And the bad news is because of our disgusting sin and filth, I'm not talking about people outside of the church, I'm talking about you and I'm talking about me because of our sin, because of our guilt, because we are disgusting on the inside. We are under the wrath, the anger of God, and we deserve hell. That's the bad news. So the good news that addresses the bad news is simply this. God saves us from God. God saves us from God. Now some of you are looking at me strangely, so let me explain that. This is why the old hymn says... "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." Or another one says, "'Be of sin the double cure, save from wrath and make me pure.'" Or the new hymn says, "'Till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied.'" This is what is written in Romans chapter 5. But God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now, let me make a case for this like I asked you to do from the Old Testament. If we go back to the story of Exodus in chapter 11... God says, I'll bring one more plague on Pharaoh, on Egypt. About midnight, I'll go into the midst. And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. Exodus chapter 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt. I will strike the firstborn. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague will not be on you to strike you when I strike the land of Egypt. The Bible is shockingly clear. The people were not saved from Pharaoh. They were not saved from Pharaoh's soldiers. They were not even saved from their own sin in that moment. Those that were under the blood of the Passover lamb were saved from God. The Israelites were saved from God's avenging angel. This is the heart of the gospel. God saves us from God. When Jesus died on the cross, 
He didn't primarily save us from the devil, just like the Passover lamb and blood did not save them from Pharaoh. Jesus did not even primarily save us from sin, but the effects of sin. Because it's not your sin that slays you. The wages of sin are death. God's judgment on your sin is death. If you were out last night drinking and sleeping around, why are you still alive here right now? Because the judgment of God has not yet fallen on your sin. You have sinned, you got drunk, you slept around. That didn't kill you, but one day that sin will be judged. And if you are not under the blood, nothing can save you from the wrath of God. But God can save you from God because the love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glories of God. Now, sometimes theology is really hard in its stark form. So many of you are from the islands or from Africa, as I am. So let me tell you the same truth through a story. There was an African king, and he had a problem in his kingdom. A a thief was stealing chickens. And the king said, this isn't good for the kingdom. We need to do something about this. And so if we find this thief, we're going to beat him with ten blows. But chickens were still stolen, and so the king got a little upset. He said, all right, thief's not scared enough. Now if we catch the chicken thief, we will beat that chicken thief with 50 blows. But the thief kept stealing chickens. And now the king, angry, full of wrath, because someone is disobeying him, causing disorder and dishonor in the kingdom, he says, when we find the chicken thief... We will beat that chicken thief with a hundred blows, enough probably to kill them. And then they found and caught the chicken thief. And to the surprise of the country and the king, the chicken thief was the king's mother. Now what does the king do? And the people wondered, what is he going to do? If he forgives the chicken thief because it's a relative, his own mother, he's not just. But if he kills his own mother, he's not merciful. What's he going to do? This is the dilemma of God. The day came for judgment. The king's on the throne. They bring the mother in front of him. He says, tie the chicken thief to the post, the whipping post. Beat her with all 100 lashes of that rod and he says to the soldiers and if you back down you will be beaten yourselves they're shocked how can the king do this this isn't merciful it's just it's not merciful they tie the mom to that whipping post they're about to beat her and he says one more thing he stands up takes off his royal robe descends down from that throne goes to that whipping post wraps his arms around his mother And then he looks at the soldiers and says, now, beat the thief. And the king took the punishment for the mother. And that's the gospel. God saves us from God. He stepped off the heavenly throne. He came to this earth. He died on the cross. And in that act, he extended his arms. And he said to the father, now, beat the thief. The love of God saves us from the wrath of God for the glories of God. That is the gospel. And the text says, second point, that it's the gospel of the kingdom. In the time of Jesus, it's called the second temple period. The Israelites, the Jewish people, have come out of exile. There's been 400 silent years. They have been betrayed by every earthly ruler. Whenever something was set up for governance, it didn't work. Even David, as wonderful as he was, commits adultery and murders. Solomon, as wise as he was, ends up with all these concubines and even far away from the Lord. 
And everyone that's been set up in place through the centuries has betrayed them. And they have understood that whenever men rule in the kingdom of men, things go south. There isn't any deliverance from the Democrats or the Republicans. Our country's still in trouble. There isn't any solution from this person or that person or education or any of the medical stuff. We still, even if we get healed in this life, we end up dying anyway. There isn't any long-term solution from any person on this earth and they had this understanding we've been fooled once we're not going to be fooled again never again are we going to put our hope in the kingdoms of men the only hope we have is when the king comes back and we're not going to trust any institution we're not going to trust any program and the desire and the hope of the jewish people was messiah will come and when messiah comes he will rule forever and that's the only thing we can look to in fact the term kingdom of god doesn't even appear in the Old Testament. And when we get into the New Testament, they don't even explain it because they knew that everybody understood the kingdom of God is when God comes back to the earth and makes everything right. And the gospel of the kingdom is referring to the return of Jesus. And we have confused it in our day. There's something called realized eschatology and essentially what that means it's a fancy term to say the kingdom is now and we can experience all the fullness of the kingdom now and that's kind of the preponderance of belief even in our societies but new testament jews didn't believe that they'd seen too much of the wickedness of men and all of their hope and all of their expectation was on that day when the king would come so when you read that expression, the kingdom of God, or see it referred to in the New Testament, remember, it wasn't really about now. It was about that day, the great day of the Lord. So when we understand that, and we hear verses like, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all, and, and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What was Jesus actually saying Seek the day when the king comes. Seek that kingdom. It will never pass away, Daniel says. It will never fade. There will be an eternal king. Seek that day when we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What are we actually praying? The return of the king. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. There is no place, in fact, earth is the one place in the cosmic universe where the will of God is not done, including in you and in me. Can any of us say that the will of God is completely done in us? It's just not happening. It never has and it never will until that day. And when the king comes, his will will be done in heaven and earth. And we pray for that. The Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's it talking about? When the king comes and the Lord descends in power and glory with the holy angels and all authority, on that day the meek will inherit the kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom, third point, shall be preached that's not a popular verb anymore it can open us to charges of hypocrisy and yet the bible tells us in corinthians it has pleased god through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe and why does god do that preaching fixes the efficacy solely on what god has done. Preaching removes any doubt that the solution is in man or in money or in programs or in projects. It's not in you. It's not in me. God through Christ is the power of the gospel and faith still comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
The gospel of the kingdom goes forth by preaching. And to be clear, it's not restrained to what I'm doing right now in a pulpit with a whole bunch of Christians. It is you opening your mouth in the marketplace and on the buses and on the campus and in the neighborhood and lifting up the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and warning everyone, the king is coming, you better be ready. The gospel of the kingdom goes forth by preaching. And the Bible's clear. We're messengers. We're town criers. We're voices crying in the wilderness. We're not the king. We're not the solution. We're not the answer. But the king is coming. The answer is coming. The solution's coming. So let's get ready to welcome the king. And this is why spirit filling in the Bible, Old Testament and New, it always affects the mouth. Because we are so aware of the coming kingdom. And we're so in love with the king. There's a fire in our hearts. And we cannot contain it inside. But we go out into the streets and the world and we proclaim, we love the king, he's the answer, he's coming, get ready, open up your hearts so the king will receive you when he comes. But here's what I've noticed in missions. When I dig wells, and when I build schools, and when I teach English, and when I provide a gym, or a coffee house, or help those who are poor, they love me. But when I open up my mouth and say the king is coming and he's the only hope for the world and eternal life, I'm not so popular anymore. And whether it's here in America or in the Muslim lands or wherever these missionaries are working in secular Europe, wherever that might be, oh, it's really popular to meet physical needs, but to challenge them with the gospel of the kingdom, you're not so cool anymore. Even right here in this nation. And the whole world is saying, just shut up about that. You don't have to talk about that. Just meet our needs and love us and be kind to us. And so the whole world, the devil himself, wants us to be silent. And the king of kings who is coming in power and glory commands us to preach. So tomorrow morning when you wake up, to whom will you bow? The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, next point, in all the world to all the nations. The global population is now past 8 billion. 42% of that 8 billion are gathered in 7,000 unreached people groups. The word for peoples in the New Testament, ethne, is where we get our understanding of ethnic groups. There are 7,000 tribes with their own language, their own religion, their own culture that do not yet have indigenous churches amongst them. That's 3.15 billion people in the world. What the text is saying to us is that that gospel of the kingdom has to be preached everywhere. Are there lost people in Fort Lauderdale? Yeah. Are there lost people in the corporate world and even in our outwardly idyllic suburbs? Yes. Are there lost people in our campuses here in America and all over the nation? Yes. But the assertion of this text is not that those who are nearby us are being neglected. What it's warning or reminding or exhorting us is that those who are farthest away always are the most neglected. We have kind of twisted Acts chapter 1 verse 8 when Jesus commissioned his disciples that they were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And we have interpreted that to say start at home and make sure everybody at home is reached and then from your Jerusalem spread out in the other parts of the world. The flaw in that hermeneutic is verse 11. Because after Jesus says that and ascends, an angel appears and says to his disciples, Men of Galilee, why are you here staring up to heaven? The point is, none of them were from Jerusalem. Jerusalem was where Messiah had just been killed. Jerusalem's where they're hunted. Jerusalem's where they're being attacked. Jerusalem's where they're hiding because of fear of the Jews. Jerusalem's not safe. That's where God tells them to start. 
away from home in a dangerous place and then keep going in successive circles to what is more strange and more foreign and more difficult to access. The missionary call to make disciples of all of the nations, it does not say that we put all of our energy here at home and whatever's left over, we give to the nations. It says we start with sending our best to the most difficult and the most dangerous places of the earth. This is why the church in Antioch sent Paul and Barnabas their best. You know what we kind of do in the church? I don't know what to do with Billy Bob here. He's not really good with the youth. He can't sing on tune, can't count the offering, doesn't really help us much. Let's send Billy Bob to Pakistan. (laughs) I don't think Pakistan's real happy about getting Billy Bob. We want the best. The world deserves your best. You don't hold on to your best, whether it's money or people, and send the breadcrumbs to the nations. That's not the heart of God. He didn't look around heaven and say, where's the little dwarf, crippled, half-blind angel? We'll send him to earth. That one can die for the sins of the world. He sent his best. When it comes to the allotment of resources, it's always the far that suffers. Pastor is asking you to have a kingdom builder heart. Did you know that last year, Americans spent more on dog food and bubble gum than the cause of global missions? Did you know that this past Halloween, more money in America was spent on costumes for our pets than all the money that was given to global missions? I'm not asking you to neglect the campus or the inner city. I'm not asking you to neglect your neighbor. I'm just saying this. If 42% of the world, 3.15 billion people in 7,000 unreached people groups don't have access to the gospel, can't we send our best and our first to them? And fulfill this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, amongst all the nations. And then it will be done as a witness. The word witness is from the Greek word martis, which is where we get our English word martyr. If we're going to do this, it's going to cost us something. Missionaries that are represented here are going to have to leave home and leave family and learn new languages and go to different cultures and struggle through all of that. And those of you who are at home are going to have to sacrificially give and pray. It's going to cost us all something. The gospel has ever gone to the uttermost under great duress. This is not new. August 10th, 258 AD, Emperor Valerian had issued an edict that all Christian leaders be put to death and their property confiscated. Sixtus II was the bishop of Rome, so he was arrested. He was being led to his execution. He had a young assistant named Lawrence. And Lawrence called out to the bishop as he's being led to his execution, are you going to leave so soon and go to heaven? And the bishop said, be comforted. You will follow me in three days. Sure enough, Lawrence was arrested. And the Roman emperor wanted the money. He thought the Christians were rich. So he said, gather me all the treasures of the church. Lawrence asked for three days, got all the widows and all the orphans, marched them to the emperor, and he said, here, these are the treasures of the church. The emperor wasn't excited about that, so he ordered Lawrence to be killed. They chained him to a gridiron and roasted him over a fire. As he had been burning for a while... He turned in the middle of that torture to his persecutors and said with a smile, You can turn me over now. I'm done on this side. What is it about guys like Lawrence and other martyrs through history that allowed them to die smiling? I'm afraid under torture I'd squeal like a stuck pig. And yet over and over through history, God has given grace to his representatives to be that witness, that martyr in all of the earth. And I have concluded 
that the only, well to, only way to die well under duress, the only way to make a joke when you're roasted alive on a gridiron, is if that's not the day that you die. But if you have died daily, discreetly, on that fateful day, that's just the last witness. It's just the final deposit. The last of a thousand little surrenders. And let our joy on that day come from the realization we're done dying and our living is about to begin. If the gospel is going to go to the ends of the earth, it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost you something. Giving more than you're comfortable with. Praying longer than you want to pray. Sending your own son or daughter. But if you will do that, and here's the last point, then this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world to all the nations as a witness. And then the end will come. I told you at the beginning that I am a missionary because I want to go home. And I told you that we're under the wrath of God and I include myself in that. I am so tired of this world. And I'm not pointing fingers at the filth and wickedness out there. You all know how quickly this nation and others are degenerating. I'm tired of what's in here. I'm tired of what's in here. I want to be ultimately, finally liberated for that. I want to be changed. I want that trumpet to sound and the sky to recede and the Lord to descend so that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, I am forever changed, ever to be with the Lord. I long for that day. And the path to that day is through the nations. When I was a child, our Christmas tradition was to open our Christmas presents early on Christmas morning. And I don't know about your families, but you know, we'd have a Christmas tree and we'd stack up the presents. And I have uh, two OCD sisters, so they'd organize them in piles of who got what. And you know, we'd shake them and try and figure out what was in there. And expectation and excitement would rise for Christmas morning. And of course, probably like you, me and my two sisters, 4.30 in the morning, we're awake. We're wanting to open those presents and my mom and dad are sleeping. And if my dad would have emerged out of his bedroom and said to my siblings and I, I want you to go to the kitchen and all those dirty dishes from Christmas Eve's meal last night, I just want you to wash up those dishes. And when you get those dishes done, then we'll open our presents. What do you think I would have done? I would have grabbed my sister's hands, whether they wanted to wash dishes or not. I would have charged into the kitchen. I'd say, let's get this thing done. Let's wash these dishes so we can open our presents. The great prize, the great gift of God is eternal life. No death, no sin, no curse, no night, forever and ever. Amen. And it's out there waiting for us. It's under the Christmas tree. And all we have to do is wash the Father's dishes. All we have to do is to preach the gospel of the kingdom in all the world, amongst every people, as a witness, and then the end will come. And as pastor gets ready to come, this is why your faith promise is so heavenly important today. Have you forgotten where home is? How badly do you want to go home? You want to hasten the return of the king? You want to be done with sin and filth and curse and sickness and racism and all kinds of injustice? You done with that? You tired with that? You want to be done with it forever? Let's go home. Let's go home. How do we get home? How do we get home? We participate in the gospel of the kingdom being preached in all the world as a witness to every people. 
and then the end will come. Let's go home. Let's get this thing done. Let's bring back the king. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Amen, amen, amen. Bow your heads with me. Online family, I want you to participate as well. Father, as we have heard a powerful word, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word, for the anointing, for the challenge. We thank you. We know, Lord, there's so much that you want to do. And you've called us to be a part of building your kingdom, not only here at home, but around the world. Globally, locally, to raise up the next generation. We thank you, Lord, that you will use us. You've blessed us to be a blessing. And in this moment, in everything that we've done to try to help the family of Christian Life Center to understand what it means to be a kingdom builder. I pray, Lord, that we will do our part. There's some here that you may be calling to go. And I pray, Lord, that they will be willing to go. There's many here, Lord, that I know the burden to go has been falling and turning and stirring. And I pray that they'll respond to that call. For the rest of us, our responsibility, our sacrifice is to pray and to send, to partner with, to be a kingdom builder. Shift us to another level. Shift CLC to another level. Shift us personally as a family, as an individual, to another level. God, I pray that that faith has been stirred within us. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. One more time, just give the Lord praise. Here's our challenge today, and that is to be a kingdom builder. Inside the bucket are so many things that we do globally, locally, and what we're doing to reach the next generation, to raise up pastors and missionaries to look into the future. The challenge is that we do what we can that's in our ability and that that's beyond our ability. If you will, take your faith promise card. Your faith promise card, it says, this is my faith promise. On the back of the card is where you're going to make a personal commitment. It's between you and your spouse, for you and your family, or for you individually between you and the Lord. We're not asking you to let us know, but I'm asking you to write down, to make a commitment, to do something. For the online family, you can go to our Kingdom Builders uh, button that's on our CLC app, and you'll find all the resources there, and I, I believe that this card is there as well. You can QR code it if you're here and you want to do it that way. We've tried to make it easy for you to understand that if I do this weekly, that this is how it compounds over a whole year. Our faith promises go from March, right now, all the way to next year's annual missions convention, next March. So we're starting now, starting next week. It's a new commitment all the way to next year's annual missions convention. So this is a new commitment. Now, if you're like me and you've automated it, You'll have to go in and update whatever it is as you shift to another level. You'll have to go into the program there, the, the giving app, and update it. But it's a new commitment. It's a commitment this year. And as you make your commitment, start with a plan. What you know you can do. It's in your ability. I started on our chart 
with $5 a week because honestly, I believe that all of us probably could do $5 a week. So I started there in the chart. Now you may say, no, I, I can do more than that. But I started there. Maybe you've been doing $50 a week already. You may want to go ahead and say, God, shift me to a new level. And begin to pray and ask the Lord, what is that? The vision is the stretch of faith. We're going to get this done. That we're going to stretch beyond. And we're saying, I'm going to another level. And I'm believing, God, you're going to help me to get there. Stretch your faith. Make a faith promise. Believe whatever it is God lays in your heart and begin to move towards it. The last is the dream, and that's just something that you're dreaming about for the future. And you're going to hold on to that in your heart. But if everybody does something, if we stretch our faith, if we shift to another level, there's power. And let's remember that as we do it, it's seed towards a harvest for the kingdom. So as we take this in our hand, maybe you're with your spouse. You maybe want to hold the hand of your spouse in this moment. Maybe you're a single mom or a single dad. You can still participate. I'm so thankful for all of the retirees that week after week after week, month after month after month, even on your retirement, your Social Security, you give. You're a part of it. You're a kingdom builder. And I just want to say thank you. Because we're helping to get this done. We're helping to do what God's called us to do. I want you to take the hand of your spouse or your children if they're here. Even your teenager if he'll let you hold his hand. And let's pray. Father, as we are now ready to make our commitment. It's a sacred moment. It's a personal moment. It's a moment that, Father, I believe you're laying into each and every one of our hearts as a family, husbands and wives, moms and dads, with our children, we're making a commitment to you. And as we do, I pray, God, that you're stretching our faith. We're shifting to another level. For many, many, many in this room, they've not been a kingdom builder. Today, we've done everything we can today and over the last few weeks to help them to understand it. And I pray now that there's faith to embrace it. And Father, as we embrace it, together as a church, we will make a major spiritual impact. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Pastor Candy, I don't have a microphone. Uh, here it is. Charles is going to give you his. Can I say that we're a result of Kingdom Builders? We stand here with you because of what you did for us so many years ago. I just want you to hold on just for a second. Pastor Tom and I were called here, and it all started many years ago when my parents were missionaries and my father stood here and God brought us all the way back around to stand here today to be an answer to your prayer and an answer to this time and this moment so know that God connects all the dots for your life it's not by happenstance that what the Lord does so just know that blessing will continue to come when you listen to what is so profoundly important what was said this morning my dad stood here many, many years ago, 30-something years ago, stood here to find that Pastor Tom and I would one day come back and we would be here to be what we are with you because God puts all things together. I just wanted to say that this morning as Pastor Tom and I, our hands are together in praying and doing the very same with you as Kingdom Builders because God's blessings are very rich and He knows what is necessary in our lives. May God bless you because Pastor Tom and I are kingdom builders now, but you have always been kingdom builders, but we're also a result of your giving. And just remember that, that the Lord is so good to us as he puts all things together. Amen. You probably already saw it, but our goal on all of our campuses this year is more than we've ever done before. 
I believe that we can do it. There's no doubt in my mind that as everyone does something, as we shift to another level, that God is going to stretch our faith and we're going to reach it. Our goal for all of our campuses is $1,250,000. The only way that we can do everything that's listed through the brochure is if we reach our goal. What happens if we don't reach our goal is there's some things that we will not be able to do. There's some Bible schools we won't be able to support. There's some orphanages that we won't be able to build. There's some children not guilting us, but the reality is this is what we get to do when everybody does something. Our goal as a campus in this is $953,000. That's our goal. All the campuses are running towards their goal. Our online family, you know which campus you identify with. If it's primarily Fort Lauderdale, when you go to the app, you choose your campus. That's our goal for this year. I again encourage you, plan it, stretch your faith in the faith promise, and then automate what you can do. If you automate it, I guarantee you're going to reach it. So we're excited for what God's going to do this year. Hold it up. I want to pray a blessing over you as our worship team gets ready to close us out. Father, we've made our commitments. We've given them unto you in our faith, in our covenant, in our commitment. Now we will put it in a place where we will continue to pray about it. We'll continue to, to, to move towards it. That which we've planned, the vision of, of what we believe, God, that you can do this year. Extra sales, extra uh, bonuses, extra ways that you will release it. Stretch our faith in our faith promise to do that vision of what we desire. It's not in the plan. It's not in the budget. But it's the vision for the year. Stretch it. Release it. Let it be, oh God. And then, God, you've laid a dream in our heart. And we're praying that you'll help us to reach that dream. We don't let it go. And I pray that as we move towards it, we'll see the fulfillment of that dream. Together, each and every one of us are kingdom builders for the glory of God. And we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's stand together. Worship team is going to close us. My life is not my own To you I belong I give myself I give myself to you Say my life is not My life is not my own To you To you I belong I give myself I give myself Come on say my life Awesome conference. Can we give God praise? Hey, remember Wednesday night? We're back in our growth groups. If you got kids and you want to get them mentored through our boys and girls Royal Ranger ministry, we got a family meeting happening right now next door in the fellowship hall. Also, we got a beach baptism coming March 25th. 
get plugged in. If you know someone that needs to be water baptized, encourage them, help them walk that next step process. And we got all the missionaries out in the lobby, so make sure you know you go, encourage them, pray with them, get their card. Uh, maybe you got some questions, you just love on them, okay? Love on them uh, and, and be a blessing to them before you leave today. Uh, let's close in our prayer. Can you say it with me? Say it loud. Say, Father, help us to be the people in the church you've called us to be. A people that always build up and never tear down. That always encourage and never discourage. A people in a church that takes the message of hope everywhere we go to everyone we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.